Welcome to the latest edition of the Grey Market Talk with Thorsten Wegener, retired market maker, formidable, and the god of investment advice, former portfolio manager, chief investment officer, and extraordinary golf player, Nick Themistocle. Thank you for being here, Nick, on a beautiful Sunday. I'm just looking out of the window. It looks a bit dull. And talking about the things that caught our mind. And we obviously had a quick discussion before uh, this intro, what we would like to start with. And the name is Nigel Farage. Nick, who is, first of all, great to have you here. Secondly, you. Who is, secondly, who is Nigel Farage? Well, Nigel Farage was probably the reason that uh, that the UK are not in Europe right now. So, um, you know, he led a political party which uh, which basically said the UK can do it on their own, um, and um, and he garnered enough support and, as we say, some fantasy um, amongst the uh, the UK, not just the UK people, but I think the politicians as well, where they kind of thought, okay, that you know there is a future for UK outside of Europe. Um, and that was enough at the right time, you know, when you pose a question to the Brits, what they want to do, um, are they happy with the state of affairs? So the answer is always going to be no, don't worry what the question is. And um, and, and the question was, do you want to stay in Europe? Um, but Nigel is, uh, a, you know, he's a very international politician, a, a member of the European Parliament, um, was actually part of Trump. Trump loved him as well. Um, but um, he's... He, you know, for for all of the things, is you know, don't get this politically uh, mistaken, but he, he's not a bad fellow, and uh, he does talk sense. And sometimes. he used to be what uh, was it a commodity trader or broker? Yeah, I think he he has city? his own wealth management, or he is in that space. So, and I think his father um, was in that space, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, his background is in finance. Yeah, and I remember he was once married to a German, even so, he has That's the. Right. The international flair. So Nigel Farage, I remember years ago, Nick, when this uh, vote was on the cards, whether we want to leave the European Union. I was on, even though I'm not British, I was on the, yeah, let's get out of, get out of it. And you told me at the time, I remember that, yes, if things would go right, that could have a positive impact, but they won't. It will be a complete cock up. And as it, as it turns out at the moment, the UK would clearly be in a better position, I think, if they would still be a member of the European Union. Yeah, but um, but obviously the uh, the decision is what the decision is. The cock up ensued. Politicians, being what they are, um, didn't really know what to do with this mandate. They didn't really understand what the mandate was about, um, and they didn't have a clear plan what to do afterwards. And they still don't really have a plan what to do afterwards. So the Europe, the UK outside of Europe, is uh, is kind of an afterthought in everything they do. Um, nobody is taking responsibility for it. And uh, life goes on outside of Europe. And, um, you know, it is what it is. One day they will decide what, what, what that means for them. But at the moment, they seem to be distracted by other issues. Yeah. And one of these distractions, actually, that's why we mentioned Nigel Farage, something very interesting happened. Nigel Farage was, I have to say, a customer at Coots. What is Coots? Coots is... Uh, Proverbial, the bank where the uh, where the queen has or the king now uh, have their money. So uh, it was a status symbol. If somebody put out the, their their check card or their credit card with the name Coots on it in the city, that's where you had to be, because they only take customers on who have at least a million pounds sterling in cash uh, to put into their accounts. And Nigel Farage, obviously a wealthy man, um, got his account cancelled by Coots, and not because. He is a criminal or there were any criminal allegations. Uh, the memos then leaked, but because of his uh, political affiliations, you mentioned already Trump and that he was responsible. He was responsible for getting this vote on uh, the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. And they actually terminated his account. And Nigel Farage being the guy that he is, he's also a presenter on GB News, one of the UK's Fox uh he actually gave all the information out. Yeah? The leaked memos that uh, the, uh, the the head of NetWest who owns Coots spoke to a BBC journalist and leaked private confidential information 
about Farage into the market. And they were deplatforming him because it's getting more and more difficult for conservatives, not for criminals, but for conservatives in the proper meaning of the word, uh, to have bank accounts in the UK. It's not the first thing. Nigel Farage obviously has the platform to make an issue out of that. And uh, let's put it that way. I was actually, terrified is the wrong word, but really concerned about what we were seeing here. You have the wrong political opinion and they can de-platform you, while at the same time, there's the thrive in all economies to eliminate cash. What's next? You can't eat anymore if uh, the whoever is in power decides they want to deplatform you from your bank because they have eliminated cash and now you can't go to a supermarket. What's the take on the ground in the UK about that? Obviously, you are more linked in what the man on the street thinks about this whole thing. Well, I'm I'm on the ground in Germany, but um, but <laughs> but you know, from where I sit. Um, this is truly an outrage. And, you know, we spoke about it before, about suddenly politicians overstepping their mark, the Canadians blocking the accounts of the truckers, yeah. you know, the freezing of the Russian reserves, um, you know, taking away Nigel's, uh, Nigel Farage's account um, because of his political views. And we know about Nigel Farage. What about the people we don't know about? And, and the important thing is, you know, last week, I think the US introduced Fed now, which is the first step that's required before they go on to their digital currency. And we all know digital currency um, could be very efficient, could be a nice way to sort of, you know, we all like a little bit of efficiency in, in how we behave. But, but um, if politicians have got the keys, if you like, to, to, to you know, decide, if you... Uh, don't spend your money by January, it's gone. If you vote for this party or if we find you reading this stuff or hearing you say, uh, Nigel, what did I say? I said, Nigel Farage said, now and then talk some sense. Uh, if we, we don't like that. We, we're going to freeze your account. We're going to take your money. This is sort of a slippery, very slippery slope for the politicians. And, you know, for the politicians who are in power, they need to make a stand on this. They need to say, but what actually happened to Farage was wrong. Um, otherwise, good luck with your cho choice to um, uh, get support from the populace when it comes to the voting um, for a digital currency. Ain't going to happen, and it really won't happen now. I mean, well, if you only worked. had if you only had a conservative government in the UK. Oh, wait, wait, you had it for fifteen years now. Uh, so what's going on there, Nick? Uh, they're calling themselves conservatives. Then this stuff happens. And yes, a couple of uh, Rishi Sunak came out and said, yeah, that's not right. What's going to happen? Uh, what's happening there? But bloody hell, 15 years, a so-called conservative government and stuff like, which reminds me eerily of what China is doing with their social credit system, is slipping into the United Kingdom. The country which actually left the European Union to be not exposed to this kind of managing your people, it's absolutely bizarre. Yes, it is bizarre. And I think, you know, this is obviously one data point in a number of data points that have taken place over the last number of years. These global movements, um, you know, they are politically at the end of the day, and they are reaching the, the people who decide. And unfortunately, in the end, when you start to make decisions like this for show, um, then you're not looking after the, uh, you know, the entirety of your people. You're you're just making political statements, um, and um, and and sadly, this is this is the state of politics today. And uh, obviously, the UK are affected by this thing. And obviously, this is the last of the yeah. Conservative governments. You know, they're going to lose. They they are cocking it up, yeah. um, and they really do need to take a, a proper stand if they want to stand a chance at the next election. It's an interesting point because we are not a political podcast here. Yeah? We are interested in what are all these political manifestations we see? What's the implication on markets? And the thing, the, the major theme, which is always in the back of my head, markets used to have a price discovery mechanism in a free market system. And obviously, I, I like my podcasts I'm listening to. I listen to a, a podcast, Wealthy On, you know them as well. And they had a chap on and he said, it's actually, we've come into a scenario where everything 
is, even if we don't call it like that, being run by the central banks. About their power of money, how to steer it, they decide where asset prices are going. They decide uh, where the economy is going. They decide uh, what freedoms people have. Even if we have still the illusion that markets are still having this price discovery mechanism, maybe that makes it for old folks with gray hair like us, or at least for me, you're smarter than I am. So difficult to see what I have learned to look at markets, at economies, at the important data points, and what is happening at financial markets doesn't seem to make sense. Yes, there have always been delays and lagging effects in the markets, but eventually markets always came to their senses and realized the rubbish that was going on. Um, am I completely wrong again? Are we are we ending into a new time? Is it this time really different because the players are different or will it end like Weimar Republic or you name it? That, that, that could well be. I mean, you know, on a scaremonger, and as you say, we're not politically oriented here. Um, this is all about, you know, the markets and where this is leading to. And we talked about in previous podcasts about uh, um, uh, command and control of the state. Yeah. But to be fair, this was not the fault of the politicians at the beginning. This was the fault of the bankers. I mean, in the end of the day, in 2008, um, you know, the, the, the banks, you know, made mistakes and the taxpayer had to step in. Um, and from that moment, all of these, these guarantees and the debts, everything went to the top of the pile. Yeah. So, you know, they, they didn't allow... Um, things to go bust. They didn't allow the great um, 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 financial crisis to become a, a great recession and a depression. So they 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 stopped the rot. But as a result of stopping the rot and putting money into the system, effectively the governments have bailed out the system. And and if you're a politician, you, you'd rightly say, well, what if, if we're going to bail out the system, then we want to have a say in the system we want to have us. And the problem with that is obviously when you get different governments coming in, different governments have different um, leanings, yeah, and different preferences, you know, whether it's green policies or whether it's it's other policies, yeah, there is a different focus. And and the moment you get that that power fully in, in the hands of the state and not the free market as it used to be, then, then obviously decisions are going to be a bit, you know, a bit questionable. Well, you know that because you lost your colonies over that taxation without representation. That's how it looks now, right? You're still being taxed like crazy. They're only even with conservative governments. They never seem to be, oh, we should reduce tax. It's always like the best you could hope for that they're not increasing them, at least not the, the, the headline figure, while introducing all sorts of shadow taxes on you. Oh, now you have to insulate your roof and you have to do this. And Germany, well, we are leading with that. Yeah, You need a new heating system. And uh, did we speak about that before? Because I love that. In Germany, there are two uh, uh, only two things where you are forced to have a consultation. One is if you get an abortion. Before that, you have to have a consultation with a doctor, which makes a lot of sense. And if you want to still have a gas heating boiler in your house, you will have to have a consultation with uh, a chimney sweep or somebody from the energy sector. These are the two things we have in Germany at the moment. And you listen to that and think, do you know what you're doing over here? So when we have this now, uh, taxation without representation, and we are discovering that the the, the, the price-finding mechanism is getting more and more disabled. Do things then, and obviously I'm not trading Germany because it, I used to trade Germany professionally, and I never liked this market. It was always too small and did what the United States did. So uh, as a private investor, well, I trade the United States. Uh, you don't have to fish around Germany. But uh, that is a conversation. I met my quant team this week in Nuremberg, Hello, guys. And uh, we were discussing actually how the DAX can be at these elevated all-time high levels when everything you hear about Germany sucks the big one. It's unbelievable. How do you get that into your books, Nick? Okay, there are two, a number of things you said there. Yeah. Um, one about the boiler thing. I mean, just, just on that, I read a story today that Michael Gove, who used to be um, a, a minister um, uh, the, the environmental minister now he is sort of swans around does doesn't says a lot of stuff and and his view is that these net zero targets need to be extended and that's always been my belief that you know the the when they realize just 
how much pressure they're putting the industry uh, and people um, to orient themselves towards a particular target um, for the good of the planet, for whatever, for other ideological or for other scientific reasons, um, those targets are just too too big. And um, and 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 he is even suggesting that these things get extended. And the result of and for example, the boiler thing is is a classic. Um, in the UK, if you want to rent your house, you have to insulate now and you have to you say, well, maybe we should push the targets out a little bit. It was 2028 now, now we move them out a little bit. And and if he's saying that, it means that a lot of people are thinking that. And all he's doing is he's just voicing something that he feels comfortable that a number of other, other politicians are thinking the same way. Um, possibly just the UK, but possibly also in Europe. I don't know. But um, but th- that is something that is, you know, it's been part of my thinking for a, a long time yeah. that there is a big assumption in the markets that um, the fossil fuels, fuels are going to go and there's something, and don't worry, it'll be fine because it's not going to be fine no. because these, these things are just not, they're not ready. They're not ready fast enough. You saw what happened to yeah. the Siemens um, um, thing. You know, I thought they could stick some windmills up and, and they'll, they'll work. You know, it does, it's, not, it's not so straightforward. And I think that is something that is a kind of a market factor that is, I think, becoming more uh, realized as, as we go on. Um, the issue about Germany, um, why, why is the DAX so high and everything else is, well, firstly, we know that uh, markets move together. So if the US goes up and, you know, the, these other things will move in sympathy. But as we know, um, there is a firm belief that the dollar will decline in um, its value across other fiat uh, yep. currencies. Um, and if you're an American investor, and you're an American asset manager, you've been telling your client base that you know the you will be over allocating to Europe versus the US. And it's not necessarily because you think Europe is going to be sort of super duper for growth. It could be. Um, we'll talk about that as well. But but you know, you're worried about the currency and you're you're thinking that you can at least benefit from the fact that the dollar is going to fall. The other factor going in favor of the of Europe, which is sort of part of this big commodity thing, is the energy transition itself. The energy transition requires investment. And where, you know, you just cannot go, to, even if you believe that these net target zero uh, dates are feasible, if you believe they're feasible, you need to spend an awful lot of money as a country in order to get the industry to invest. Well, the banks don't necessarily have the balance sheet capacity to do it. So the governments are almost certainly going to have to support that. And what that means is potentially a big capex boom for Europe. So there is the argument that even though the economy of Europe looks awful, even though the, the politics is, you know, it's not stable, it's not something you can rely on, but you look forward and you say, well, where is the the world in its current state, it's in that energy transition. We know that. But we don't know the end date now. Maybe that shifts, but you still, you know, you're going to have a go at that as a government. And, and if you're going to have a go at that, then you need to make sure there's investment. And you can imagine the numbers we're talking about to, to transition the economies of today to a different type of energy source. And that just means you know, that's 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 a trillions or in, in German billion. I, I read one number that said three hundred trillion US dollar would the transformation cost. Well, you know, trillion. there you go. There's that, that. Who's gonna? Who's got the balance sheet capacity for that? All right. When when we look at the total global debt is three hundred and fifty trillion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it is the size of the existing debt pile today. Yep. The existing debt is mainly refinancing. That's why we focus on liquidity. But now we're talking about new financing. For the first time, new financing may become more important part of that sort of debt issue than the refinancing. And this cannot come from the, you know, you just can't go to your local shop and say, or or bank and say, well, can we borrow some money to, you know, we want to build an energy storage system. um, the money that we're talking about is so big. This has to be a big program of, of government support and stuff like this. And so the people who fantasize about Europe today and, and investing in Europe today, they're not looking at the politics. They're not looking at, you know, are some companies moving to China and some to the States. They're looking and saying, well, okay, 
there has to be a transition that must mean a capex boom that must be very profitable for banks it must be very um sort of good for growth going forward and maybe that's where it is you mentioned you mentioned that before through through the whole uh, gray market talks we had in the past this shift to command control economy which that would mean is actually an explanation we've seen that many times over yeah? venezuela or brazil or all Chile, all the countries, when they switch over to socialism, you have this huge boost in the stock markets at first because this capex spending is coming in, yeah, because they don't care whether the checkbooks are balanced or not. There's a political aim, and money is going to be pushed in. It's horrible when you think about that. One of my, uh, you know him, Eve. One of my brightest students. He's one of the best investors I know. You probably have never heard of because he's doing it from well from the privacy of his farm. And um, he prepared a presentation for me about Kondratiev, for everybody who hasn't heard about the Kondratiev cycle. They're long business cycles, yeah, from three years to seven years, 15 years. And then we have an overarching long cycle, 60 years from top to top or bottom to bottom. And Nikolai Kondratiev was a Russian economist who ended up uh, in the gulags because Stalin didn't like reality, um, what he was analyzing. And he came from the pure data science. And this Kondratiev cycle, this overlay, always ends up with when we are going into a down trough with something, the currency debasement, and you inevitably end up with a war because that's the only way out of the pickle we have. And we discussed this privately, the situation we have at the moment when last week came out that Russia now says, uh, Ukraine, uh, we're not giving you safe, safe passage anymore uh, for your grain uh, exports. That is actually a terrifying, um, well, subject. If you think about that, the European Union at the same time is introducing a lot of laws to reduce the agricultural uh, production we have, huh? especially Holland. They are going crazy over there. In Germany, we have the same. I'm a, I'm a farm boy. I grew up on farms with my uncle and uh, my grandparents. Um, none of them would, if they were still alive, none of them would uh, go into the business of uh, producing crops anymore because it's not uh, economically feasible anymore so on the one side we see a country like china can't feed itself the russians are now pulling a pin out of yeah let's still export uh, uh, food into countries who need it then i read that the chinese are the biggest buyers of agricultural products uh, in the world at the moment uh, at the same time the food from ukraine which should go to egypt and other countries will probably not end up there and uh, uh, we're having a picture, if I'm coming back to this Kondratiev cycle, we see the debasement of currency. Yeah? Since the Fed started, the US dollar has not lost 95% of its value. That's simply true. Yes. Somebody, somebody sent me a picture the other day. You saw uh, an ounce of gold and the amount of dollars next to it in 1913 that it would have bought. And then the a big pile of US dollars versus the same one uh one ounce of gold and so if we take that as a given and we see all the warmongering going on and we see that we're tinkering with our food supply uh geopolitical risks nobody believes until they actually happen i love history and uh, it reminds me also of the 1914-18 uh, the first world war nobody wanted it it didn't make any sense and then we ended up with this horrible scenario where millions and millions of people died Am I exaggerating here again, or has that become more prominent, the danger of uh, an escalation in this whole uh, worldwide well, like, political pickle we're in at the moment? Well, I mean, <clears throat> okay, you missed India as well. I read yeah. this week India had um, uh, restricting the export of certain rice uh, products uh, around the world, and and for especially African countries, that's that's like a, that's a really big thing. Um, and obviously they're doing it for their own self-survival and their own inflation yeah. issues. And the Chinese, you know, the Chinese are actually building up, um, you know, oil reserves. They're building up food reserves. You know, this is normally sort of a prelude to something. Um, um, and, and they're just making sure they're OK. And, and when and it's the point I made earlier about sort of what is it as a government you are focusing on? And if you are focusing on, you know, some some um, um, nice themes that you want to show, you know, your voters that you are modern and, and, and forward thinking and stuff like that. And if you're not thinking about where you're, where's your energy coming from, 
where's your food coming from? It's the first two priorities of yeah. any government. Feeding your people, you know, getting energy to your industry. And those are the issues that perhaps are more the afterthought, but they are being looked at in other countries. And, um, and, and you know, that's, that's a really important thing to think about. So it, it tells you that uh, people are preparing for some instability in the future and, you know, whatever the form that takes, you know, we don't know, God forbid. Is, um, is any other thing? Sorry. No, I, I was just wondering, is there, do you see, uh, because that is something which, maybe I'm completely wrong, is there a relaxation in the support of the United States for the Ukraine at the moment? Because I'm surfing through the underbellies of YouTube, so you don't have to do it. And there's one channel they've interviewed a retired general, and they said... Uh, It's actually, yes, he thinks that the support for Ukraine is waning, not because they don't want to support democracy and everything, but it's the ammunitions. United States is running out of supplies in their artillery, art, artillery shells, especially, because they facilitated for the last war. And this interesting data point was in the whole Iraq war, the United States Army uh, expended about 80,000 artillery shells. This is what Putin shoots at the Ukrainians in one day at the moment. So America, and that went actually through the mainstream media as well. They had a couple of senators coming out who said, we're having problems. We're don't, we do not have enough ammunition to fight wars when the United States would get attacked in our typical crisis scenarios we have in here. So if that is a natural necessity, that could actually take the heat off the stove again a little bit and come to a peaceful conclusion in Ukraine. Yeah, that's that's option one, preferred option. Option yes. two is that they stop the conventional one, do something a bit more stupid. Um, but yeah, option one, hopefully, um, you know, they say, look, this is not good for anyone. And and something which is mutually beneficial, um, you know, would be good for the entire world, I must say. Stock markets always did fantastically well before war actually broke out. You know that? Yeah, let's not talk about war. <laughs> but um, stock markets are doing fantastically well we know um too many bears possibly i was um w w with a client um and, and he asked me and he knew my thoughts a whole you know of last year the year before and everything and then and i've been saying this is not a bear market this is you know you want to be holding on to your long positions and so he knows that i've been positive throughout this whole kind of process Yeah. Um, and he said to me, why is it still going up? And I said, well, because there are still people who say this is 1929 and, you know, this is 2000. They're still putting out the little fractal charts everywhere um, and, and scaremongering, I must say. So I, I think they are all gradually. And I, I read uh, an article that some of these guys who've been selling these, you know, end of the world stories have now turned officially bullish. And uh And I think that it's it's that we talked about a few weeks ago, I said the point of recognition, you know, an Elliott wave third of a third is a point of recognition. It's that point of recognition where people who thought, oh, this is a continuation of the bear market suddenly realize it's not. But the dynamics of the last phase are, you know, you'd be saying, well, why would you buy this thing? And and I'm sure we're going to see some some more numbers. And I mean, we're just had, having the earnings season now, sort of negative growth. Yeah. But positive surprise. So you read the positive out of it. So before they'd have read the negative out of it. Now it's about the positive. So, you know, as I say, new highs, um, but the state of the economy is, is, is not clever. We know that. I think a lot of our loyal followers are actually waiting for me to turn bullish to short the crap out of the market. That, that I'm, I'm me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> so... Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Anyway, but you just mentioned earnings season and one of the uh, canaries in the coal mine, if you can call it a canary, it's like a big fat, I don't know, turkey, was American Express for me last week because American Express said, yes, we stick with our full year guidance, looks good. And the, uh, the consumer in the United States is still very resilient, fantastic. And then they were talking about something they called network traffic. Network traffic is simply... Well, the amount people use their credit cards and swipe them up and down and up and down and up and down. Yeah? And it's still positive, positive growth rates to the previous quarter. However, they split it into three parts. One part I found interesting, the private consumer in the United States. The growth, rate, growth rates have dropped by 30%. Now, 
business consumers, yeah, the guys who handed in the good old days corporate credit cards to us and say, yeah, use it. Doesn't happen anymore, but it was a good time. So uh, that has dropped by 80%. And the worldwide uh, drop in growth rates, yeah, and we're still in positive territory, for American Express, X the US, uh, was 50%. Sorry, that's not longer a canary in the coal mine for me. Um, that is actually a data point I really want to look out. And next week, uh, I've called it Hell Week in our conversations, we have Visa and MasterCard coming out, which could be a confirmation to these data points. So, yeah, if you want to see me turning bullish so that you can start shorting the markets, this is one of the indicators which definitely has to turn because that doesn't look good for me. Same with, uh, we're looking at the PMIs. In Germany, we are clearly in deflationary territory here. Yeah. yeah. And Remember, market, yeah, sorry, please. And, and, and the markets are still at these elevated levels. You have, we're both a little bit older. We have seen that before over and over again. Everybody sees the data. Everybody knows what the data means, but the market doesn't do it. Doesn't do it yet until everybody suddenly focuses on the stuff they have discussed privately three weeks before. I said, oh, that looks really horrible. And then everybody wants to do the same. And that's actually the point I'm waiting for with this earnings season now coming up. We have Microsoft coming up and my favorite stock, NVIDIA. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductors delivered, well, average numbers. Aren't yeah. they one of the suppliers for this 8 billion boost in revenues from NVIDIA? We discussed that four, six, we eight did. weeks ago. We forecast that. <laughs> well, we said, okay, maybe that was just a time lag. Then when uh, uh, Taiwan Semiconductors in the past reported, they didn't have the order of NVIDIA on their book yet. They surely should have been in these numbers, but uh, the numbers didn't show some big bump on the upside. Um, I think... NVIDIA is coming out 21st of August, 23rd of August, something like that, end of August. And when uh, Taiwan Semiconductor came out, there was a small dip in the NVIDIA price, 10% yeah. on the day. That was all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, when, when everyone's short, right? So it comes down. I, I've been in the game so long. I, I stopped early on to try and say, if I could predict what's going on with the market just by looking at some leading indicator or, you know, I don't know, American Express uh, a quarterly announcement, you know, it'd be fine, but you couldn't. And that's why I shifted to say, well, I'll try and orient myself in this way, but you have to wait until momentum or trends, something actually stops before you say, I'm out. And even in March 20, when we had this thing go like a, a stone down, there was plenty of time where I, I you know, I checked my signals uh, to actually you'd say in February, you'd have been out. And this is so important that if, if we focus just on these narratives, there's always something that we find out later. Oh, that's why it went up. And, and, and it's very, very dangerous just to focus on what everyone else is focusing on. You see the price going up. You say, well, why is it going up? Don't ask yourself why it's going up, right? So there's something. There is, you'll find out later why. And for example, stock markets normally lead the economy by a few months. So it could well be that, well, perhaps the numbers start to get better. And remember, one of the fundamental things that help stocks is falling inflation. Right. And inflation has been falling like a stone. The point I wanted to make earlier, just one last thing for me, um, was this, this story of, of money. When money was thrown into the system in 2020, 2021, that money, this is, I'm a monetarist, so I believe that the growth of money was the cause of inflation and not anything else. So that money gets used up with growth and it gets used up with inflation. Yeah. And over time, that amount of money that was put into the economy is being used up. So that's why the percentages that you're seeing from Amex are going down because people are gradually, you know, the money that they had from what was given to them over the years, over the, those two years in the COVID time, is gradually running out, right? And, and that's what we're seeing. And the question comes, how quickly does the Fed or other central banks react when they realize that actually things are slowing down much faster than they had anticipated. As I, as I say, they turn the dial with the interest rate. 
it's not the interest rate that's been doing a lot of this stuff, right? It's just been the world using the money that they put in. That's also student loans are running out or the, 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 the break in paying back the student loans are running out in August, September, October, somewhere in the United States. So you have this big group of opinion leaders, the youth, yeah, who will buy less sneakers, go less into restaurants, uh, will spend less money, will influence, therefore, their parents to say, oh, I need more money, mom and dad, uh, which are most likely hardworking people, so they can spend less on their consumption. It's all these little pinpricks I come in there. And then you just mentioned the, the central banks. Uh, we we also had over the last week this discussion, European Central Bank, what are they going to do? If my picture is right, I, I've mentioned Volkswagen last week, where there is, it seems to be sheer panic about their product policies, jumping completely onto the carbon neutral train, realizing now what you mentioned earlier, we don't have the bloody replacements. As I mentioned, I was in, in Nuremberg on Thursday, uh, checked into a hotel, and there was a gentleman in front of me, older gentleman who apparently had an electric car. And he was inquiring, oh, there's one loading booth in the garage at the hotel, but that was taken. When would that come, become available? Otherwise, he couldn't travel. And it reminded me of the time of, I don't know, the Pony Express. Yeah? You also had to water and feed your horses for two, three hours before you could get on. And I thought, that can't be right. Yeah? I have my gas guzzler outside. I can drive home whenever I please to do so. So when all these things are coming in, you see uh, one of the biggest companies in Germany worldwide, even Volkswagen is in sheer panic. He said, be next week. Are they going to raise interest rates? And are they going in again? So will they do, in Germany, it's called a blutkrätsch in, in football. Yeah? The other guy is already uh, no danger anymore, but you tackle him anyway. Uh, will that happen in the Europe, uh, in the European Union? Will the ECB, in the best tradition of central banks, do the wrong thing again? Yes. <laughs> okay, fine, we sorted that out, Nick. That, that's right. But historically, they have always raised rates even when there are signals of, let's just say, recession coming or uh, the economic numbers have turned down. The, um, they tend to wait until they get look back statistics which confirm what they um, should be doing rather than forward-looking statistics. And uh, sadly, that's just the, the history of, of what central banks have, have done. They tend to over-tighten the screw and then they have to over untighten the screw on the other way, which got us into the mess that we're in now. And, um, and, and it's just a fact. So if they continue to raise rates, then, you know, they'll continue to raise rates. And, and that's that. By the way, that was one of my other wild theories uh, on a facetious note. The United States, uh, that came from the political side, uh, actually uh, waited for the Bureau of Labor Statistics to declare uh, a recession, yeah, two negative quarters of growth. And they said we didn't have one because uh, employment was still fine. If they would have declared these two negative quarters in after the old definition, as a recession, I would have almost been with you and said, yeah, we had our recession. That was the thing I was waiting for. Now we are uh, Goldilocks, boom phase, fine. We are late cycle, wherever. Now things start making sense for me again. But I'm still like, uh, uh, how do you call it? I'm looking at this inverted yield curve and think something has going to happen. All the other pinpricks coming in. And I haven't got my recession yet. I want to buy shit, but I want to buy it cheap. Yeah, I yeah. still believe the world's not ending. But I do not want to buy it at these elevated levels. I need my recession. And they're not giving me the recession at the moment. Yes, the earnings numbers are pretty critical. And, you know, it looks like, you know, this, this year is kind of flatlining. And, and, but you still see the analysts for Q3 and Q4 um, still very, being very optimistic on, uh, on those numbers being uh, far better. They keep pushing out the, uh, the, the good numbers, I must say. And, um, you know, the, the, this is quite an important thing, but the, the story you just gave about, you know, the guy at the, at the hotel trying to plug in his, his, his thing, um, what a great opportunity for an economy to start to uh, um, spend some money on infrastructure and grow. This is something, by the way, we, we also spoke about China. China went down this route. It, it you know, it had its sort of... It, boost to the commodity cycle yeah. in, in yeah. the 2000s for, you know, for 10 years or so until 2008 when, when the world fell apart. Um, and it can't do it anymore. And, and, you know, China has already spent on infrastructure. But what this is saying is that, you know, it's probably about time, certainly America, 
can spend on infrastructure. And it's not just infrastructure. It's this friend-shoring, near-shoring, um, and reshoring that needs to take yeah. place in America, where it, even the you know the, the CEO of Raytheon, I don't know if I said it before, the CEO of Raytheon said, look, actually, you know what? We de- depend on China to deliver us stuff to build so that we can threaten them at the end of the day. Um, and um, we don't make this stuff here. They do. So if the Americans really want to be in control of their supply chains, they do need to reshore. They do need to make stuff. They do need to spend more money in their economy. And, you know, that means making the roads up to these factories, the, the railroads and all of this stuff. Again, this is a this is a story of CapEx boom. So you can be as, as fantasy as you want on this thing. Money needs to be spent if you want to get your economy in a solid um, uh, way, uh, ready for whatever, you know. So you could say China spent their one free bullet they had with this socialist shift into a command economy. Suddenly you have this huge capex outflow. You see that in the Chinese stock markets, Chinese financial markets generally. Uh, Now it could be actually Europe's turn to spend their one silver bullet, at least to have a short term rise in economic activity, uh, the question still is, where's all that money coming from? Germany is already broke. Huh? Uh, they made a, a beautiful picture around about the Maastricht criteria, criteria last week. So what before at 2019, Germany was just harboring below. And now obviously everybody is, well, nobody is actually taking care of uh financial responsibility anymore it pretty much looks like modern monetary theory has won we can print money as much as we like we don't see the danger anymore and i think the first time i heard this line was from jeffrey gundler who said it's neither monetary uh it's neither money nor monetary and barely a theory <laughs> <laughs> but when you see what they're doing at the moment it's like yeah fine it will be you know it's this it will be fine guys yeah old guys with gray hair sit back we have it under control we're going to do what is necessary and uh, this this whole uh, explanation we also said it last week what we always forget or have to remind ourselves of is that equity markets are one of the best leading indicators we have until they are not. Indeed. No, no, absolutely right. Uh, absolutely right. So you talk about silver bullet and, and for Europe, but they, you know, it requires a politician who want, who's going to be bold and say, we need to focus on this. If we really do believe in these targets, we need to focus on this stuff. And you say where the money's going to come from. Well, it's either going to come as off balance sheet, like it normally does, where they say, oh, it's a guarantee. Or it's a you know it's a, it's a son, son, Sondervermögen in German. Sondervermögen mal zwei, uh, mark zwei, as it were. Um, oh, it's another German word. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You know, this it needs to be invested. And, um, and if you say, I'm sorry, I don't have the money anymore, well, then you need to look at what you're spending your money on. And and I'm sure there are things that you're spending your money on that you could possibly be saving today. Oh. There's a nice indicator people do not talk too much about. You know, I'm a watch buff for well, for decades since I could start. But I'm one of these guys. I'm a collector and I never buy in the gray market. I always buy retail, which gives me an advantage. And I think I have a good eye for stuff that keeps value. That is the purpose of my investments, not to make a killing. Now, they always underperform uh, the S&P in the long term, but it's preservation of money. Uh, that is important for me. Actually, do you know if you invest in a real asset, what the only asset class that outperformed the S and P over the long term? Probably gold, whiskey in barrels. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, no, I don't have whiskey in barrels. But anyway, however, this is stuff you can research very easily on the internet, and that's also the the uh, discretionary spending, which also shows enormous weakness out there. Um, for used. Luxury watches. The prices have come down for Rolex, Patek, Philippe, Order, Mars, PK over the last quarter, 20% from their peak. Yeah. It's not the only thing. It, this, this, you know, it's the same thing with the crypto. It's the same thing with all of this NFTs. It's the same thing with a lot of these uh, companies, these SPACs, whatever you call them, um, that were launched in 21 in this whole reflation time. The world was good. Money was, you know, just thrown out lower for longer it basically said to the world you know go and do stuff yeah. and so people went and spent an awful lot of money on stuff and now they're being absolute you know they've had the rug pulled i mean that's also not very clever central banking at the end of the day that's not very good for the business cycle to go up and you know see these boom and bust 
times, but uh, hopefully they've learned something. Yeah, well, the punters got host in the real asset market, and I'm waiting now for um, the punters getting host in the equity markets, which I'm focused on. But uh, I think uh, to close this whole thing, I should make a special announcement. We make a special gray market talk the moment I turn bullish, uh, just to let everybody who subscribes to us know uh, that I now believe uh, we see the golden times ahead of us. I'm still not there yet. I'm looking at the data. I'm, I'm, maybe I've been too data driven with the old framework I had. What I find very enlightening, Nick, is uh, your take on the command control economy because that's always which I black out. But we see that we see that right in front of us, and that would be one fantastic explanation why we see market levels, especially on the equity side, where they are at the moment. We have a presidential cycle. You spoke about cycles and contracts yeah. and, and all of this stuff. Well, there's another cycle you didn't mention is the presidential yeah. cycle. And the majority of times, and I don't, I think there were only two, I'm not sure, since 1950, maybe two or maybe three, where the presidential cycle, either the final year ahead of or the year ahead of the um, um, presidential election was always a, a boom type for US stock markets. So, uh, you know, maybe this, this, This doesn't sort of work that way. But real assets, we spoke about that as well. Um, you know, they have to, the, the size of the debt means that they have to continue to inflate their way. You mentioned that also earlier. And that just means some real assets, gold, maybe Bitcoin, maybe, you know, decent housing um, is, uh, um, is, is the place to be to shelter until um, the command uh, and, and, uh, and control Uh, people actually get to grips with where they really do need to spend their money on the economy, which is on stuff which is good for the people at the end of the day. So could it, could it be different this time, Nick? I said that last time. Um, I know. I, I had to slip it in. <laughs> I did say that last time. I stick to it, actually. I stick to it. It is different because they got to bow their way out of this huge debt pile. So therefore, it must be different. If they you know, do the same, the host. What, what I'm taking from our conversation today is actually, again, you open up my mind a bit about this whole control command economy thing. Yeah? There is a good explanation. Uh, obviously, the consequences are maybe I can close with the famous word of words of Maggie Thatcher. The whole problem with problem with socialism that sooner or later you run out of other people's money. Yeah? Indeed. So at the moment, we are on the phase where we can still still spend other people's money and eventually the other side will come. In the meantime, I'll use options to, well, mitigate my risk and still make some money, uh, even though I have the wrong opinion. And uh, let's see what next week brings. I think it will be very, very interesting for us with all the central banks making the wrong decisions, companies reporting bad earnings and uh, a deflationary scenario might be in the figures. And uh, Then probably next week, I will say to you, yeah, I was absolutely right. And you say, yeah, but markets went up anyway. Follow the prices uh, and not the economic numbers. The prices tell you the truth, in my oh, view. So, maybe, uh, maybe I can make a plaque about an unpublished video, which will come out uh, uh, in two weeks' time on the German side by Murad Oers. Murad is one of my quants, and he is telling you exactly what Nick just briefed me on, follow the prices. And he's going into the relative rotation graph to see how can market data, the market prices of the sectors actually tell you where I, where you are in this game. You don't need any divining. You just follow the data. And the data, yes, proves Nick right and proves Murad right at the moment. And my divining of the future is not to be seen in the markets at the moment. Have a look at that. It is in German, but uh, it's going into our deep dive section as well because it gives a really fantastic overview. And you can, if you are not uh, uh, able to buy a Bloomberg terminal, you can find all the data in the market for pretty much nothing. So that was my final plug. Nick, let's break down now because I have to go to the airport now. Go. And uh, I hope I see you again next Sunday. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this one thing I'll have to think about probably the whole week, command economy. It's on the cards, and I'll have to read into what happened in the other countries who did that before. Very interesting point. Um, we will be on next Sunday again, right? Indeed. Perfect. Nick, any last words? I'm looking forward to Murat's presentation. I love RRT charts, and I think they are extremely helpful um, for everyone. So even if it's in German, I'm sure um, you know, I, I shall watch it. 
hey, it's the language of thinkers, <laughs> allegedly. Okay. Thank you very much for watching us. Do the like thing, the share thing, and the yes, please. thing. We will uh, uh, obviously always have a look into the comments, try to answer them either on air or in writing. And we're looking forward to see you next week again. Nick, thank you very much. All our viewers, thank you very much for being our guest today. See you. Bye. Bye-bye.